for 45 years in keeping Louisville weird, Electric Ladyland has been there for all your eccentricities. While they do offer the best smoking supplies out on the market today, there's a whole lot more to check out. From ashtrays and blacklight posters, to records, incense and burners, and items to stock your metaphysical supply. They're open from 10 to 10, seven days a week. Located at 2325 Bardstown Road in Louisville, Kentucky, and at electricladyland420.com. Roll out. Hey, metalheads, you like tattoos? Of course you do. If you're in the Louisville, Kentucky area, come on over the bridge to Clarksville, Indiana, and get you some ink done at Ageless Art. If ink isn't your thing, they have a piercing studio as well. Visit agelessartclarksville.com to see some frequently asked questions, meet the staff. The shop is open Monday through Thursday, 12 to 8 p.m., Saturdays, 12 to 10 p.m., and Sundays, 12 to 6 p.m., all appointment-only spots. You can set up your appointments by phone at 812-283-1793 or email agelessarttattooandpiercing at gmail.com and someone will get you set up for your first or your next tattoo or piercing. Hey, Metalheads, after going to a rager, what's your ultimate go-to? Mine is totally pizza. So when Overload is playing or I'm promoting the Metal Forge Live showcases or the big goddamn metal show, I go to Pizza Donisi. Pizza Donisi is gourmet artisan pizza from right here in Louisville, Kentucky. It features things like the pizza of the month, the sandwiches, and also vegetarian and vegan options, which is so totally fucking cool for all, all of it's It's awesome pizza. You definitely want to go. Hey, and also, from time to time, they do cannolis. Oh, so fucking good. You know what they said, man. Leave the gun, take the cannoli. Yeah, just like that in Godfather. They're located right next to the Mag Bar at 1396 South 2nd Street. So either stop in or call in at 502-213-0488. They're open till midnight. The Witching Hour. Heineken, fuck that shit. Pabst Blue Ribbon. Hey, Metalheads, you all hear me talk about Magbar all the time. It is the home to the Metal Forge Live showcases and is an integral stop in the Ultimate Underground Metal Tour schedule. They obviously feature live music, but the Magbar also has daily specials like Pint and Slice Night on Tuesdays with Pizza Donisi, but they also do Bring Your Own Vinyl on Thursdays with DJ Kent Jackson and Finer Things Sundays located right next to Pizza Donisi at 1398 South 2nd Street open 3pm to 4am 7 days a week get your asses out to the mag bar rock out in a broken wasteland Come to my fire And place your blood and steel Upon my fire
in three, two, one. What's going on, metalheads? Thank you all for tuning in to this week's episode of the Metal Forge. My name is Mark Jackson, and I am your host. Holy shit, what an awesome week it has been. Uh, from major festivals in Houston, a la Hell's Heroes, and we'll be talking about that in just a minute. But this week's guest from the UK, uh, you know, from London actually, is where they're at, and they are Urn. Holy shit, stoner sludge, metal, metal core, kind of a whole big different thing here. Uh, they had an album come out last August called A Feast on Sorrow, and such an awesome fucking deal, like The Great Wave is the album cover, and I'm going to bring on Jason now from the Heavy Metal Wasteland, Jason Gardner. Dude, what's up? How much, man? I'm just wondering, am I still exiled to the Wasteland, or am I just like just around me. I mean, I don't know. I mean, you've been on a lot. You're kind of like the co-host sometimes, but you haven't done an interview for a, a very long time with me on here. So it's and it's been since the uh, since the better part of last year since you've been yeah. on the. Well, Forge. I mean, a lot of times it's just the scheduling, uh, or I don't know of the band. It's hard to talk to somebody I don't really know anything about to uh, just talk. You know what I mean, dude? That's why so. you do the research. Yeah. But because also, this could be, I mean, but like, you also like to listen to. You actually yeah. like to, to be a listener to the Metal Forge, even though you probably don't rate and review the show. I'm not only the co president, I'm also a client. Yes, exactly. Yeah, uh, yeah you, you've been a client twice. You know? I'm not even a co president, really. I just, that, that was like. Um, the, the Sly Sperling. Some 80s commercial or something, some saying. Yeah, it's the hair like club for men. Yes, that's right. Sly that's right. Sperling, baby. Fucking, dude, dating yourself now, man. Fucking, he was at WrestleMania 10. Yeah. And he looked like fucking Sylvester Stallone almost. He was like a copycat of him. Right. He had like the same fucking sly hair from like Rocky Five, the non-existent Rocky film now. Do you, like the, Rocky Rocky do you like the Rocky franchise? Yeah, I do. I mean, it's got it's, it's got its own version of cheese, I mean. Dude, the really like over the top like anthem anthemic music or did we talk you know, about this the, uh, the other day off this off the air was that you and I no okay because there was somebody I was talking to and I can't remember who it was about talking about Rocky and talking about how two was their ultimate favorite because Rocky wins yeah it's a rematch yeah, obviously. yeah but they hated Rocky four like through and through hated four hated five yeah. Five, I understand why anybody hated, but like I Balboa, like but Balboa, uh, uh, in Creed Three, was supposedly like really fucking good. It was like making a fucking anime Rocky film. I never, yeah, I don't know. I, I watched like the first Creed movie, and it, it didn't really do much for me. I never continued with that series. I mean, just I thought the, the same, first one was good. It just didn't have the same feel. It needs like some. It, it didn't have. It took itself way too seriously. Where Rocky was kind of like. It's a little cheesy, you know. It's like kind of lighthearted, even though like the fight choreography is like pretty brutal. But yeah, it, the Creed movie just like took itself like way too seriously. So, I mean, it was a cool idea to like tie it all together, but it did. It, it, right now, what did you think though? Like you said, how the the fight choreography was pretty brutal on that. But what about like the fight choreography and like Rocky and Rocky Two? No, that's what I meant. The the fight choreography in the Rocky movies are pretty brutal. But they're kind of lighthearted at the same time. Right. There's that 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 fucking hail mary fucking swing to the f fucking fence and shit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Da -da 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 -da. yeah. The the dramatic music that the Bill. Oh, dude, Conti. it's like it's like uh, it's you know the trainer with the close up of the trainer like yelling at him, you know, and stuff like that. It's just like oh, it's I know, fucking no pun Mickey, intended. Man. The over the top movie. <clears throat> Mickey, Mickey's gym, dude. Fuck. Yeah, man. It's the yeah, best. It's but, uh, yeah. yeah, so, I mean, I like the series. And I was recently talking about uh, how somebody, a friend of mine, had watched Terminator again for, the, for like, the first time in, like, five or six years. That's and, it? It's five or six? Yeah. But, That's I mean... not long. Well, I know. Uh, it was honestly... I, mean, I, watch it, I watch it, like, almost yearly, so... Really? Like, the okay. original Terminator? Oh, yeah, yeah. I haven't watched it for a while. I think I want to go back and revisit it. I know it's great anyways, 
Yeah. But but uh, it it was like we were talking about how you could just literally stop at two and not have to worry about any of the other sequels. Yes. And which is great. But even though there's parts of three that are good, mm-hmm. there it's still not a great film. I thought three was a good action movie. I think it was a very good Terminator movie. Right. That makes sense. The best like, part the, of that is when he's walking out of the cemetery. Badass, I thought. Like the crane and stuff was cool. Um, the part where he like got the the coffin out of the ground and was like holding it with like blowing all the people with the machine gun. That's pretty awesome. Um, but yeah, the, as far as like a Terminator movie though, I don't know. It took a lot out because they changed the actor who played John Connor. And it's just like when they when they when they change something like that drastically, it kind of just takes you out of it. And you know, and the thing about that is, is yes, it was Nick Stahl, but you know what? Eddie Furlong could have been John Connor in that film because he was still around the se- a similar age to where yeah. he could have played that role. Yeah, he was just a, he was just a fuck up. That's why they didn't hire him. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and because let's see, you know what was he? He was like thirteen and like ninety two or some shit, or twelve and like ninety two, mm-hmm. and when that one came out, and then fucking like what, like seven or eight years later? I mean, fuck, he was in Detroit Rock City. In that time, what he was in a crow movie at that time. Oh, one of those sequels that we watched. <laughs> yeah, one of the what, whatever fucking crow movie that shit fucking was. Like the fucking, the one with, uh, I don't know, the uh, Scars Guard, the one that they're, and as you know, that's a whole thing people bitch about. Like even with fucking like, even in the music community, they bitch about remakes and shit. It's like, don't fucking watch them. You don't have to subscribe to it. I just think it's a lack of imagination. I mean, the, the story's already told. It's on film. If you, if you want to watch it, just find it on there. You know? Well, mean, the thing about it is, is they've been remaking movies since they've been making movies. I know. Scarface is a remake. Well, yeah. So is fucking uh, the Maltese Falcon with Humphrey Bogart. It's a fucking remake. But still, like, sometimes the movie's just good enough to leave alone. and it, It's good enough. Right. I mean, yeah, you can always expand on stuff, but, like, it's just, like, do you think the new Dune is better than the original Dune with fucking, uh, Can I be Laughlin? honest with you? Can I be honest with you about Dune? You uh, don't my like My dad it? was a big Dune book fan. Like, huge. Had them all. Makes sense. And, uh, and, uh I, he, he wanted me to read it so bad. And, like, I started the first one. Just Frank Herbert's Dune. 1960 something. 65. And then I sort of got, there's a whole chapter in that book talking about the properties of sand. Like, that book is so detailed <laughs> and dense. Like, I just cannot get into it. And then, you know, I tried to watch the movie. It, like, it came out on, like, HBO streaming the same day as theaters back during COVID. So I watched it the, the day it came out. And dude, I, I still couldn't get into it. Like, I just, I don't know. It just, it's just something I just can't get over. Like, how. It's just like how kind of boring it is, really. Well, I also think too. It's a very, it's a very slow burn, but it's almost too slow for me. Right. That makes sense. I get that. No, I totally get that. But I also think too, there is a magic in reading something or or taking something in in the idea of the way it was originally done. Right. Which that was actually a group of serials that was released. The first Dune was. Between 1963 and 64. So reading it episodically like that would probably make such a difference. You know, because you had to wait for the next one to come out. It's right. kind of like Star Wars in that respect. But, you know, maybe that maybe that would change it, I guess. As yeah, opposed my, to dad, picking my up- dad had them all. He, they're still down there at his house, I'm sure. The, you know, Dune, Children of Dune, Something of Dune. The Heretics of Dune, yeah. He read them all, man. That and Dragonlance. He has all those, too. Nice. Dude, Dragonlance is fucking awesome because those were actually fucking campaigns Mm -hmm. that were run with Gary Gygax uh, running the game. Like the Margaret Lee's and Tracy Hickman books in particular. Yeah, do you remember uh, remember Clan of the Cave Bear? That was another one. He liked that one a lot, too. Nice. Hell yeah, dude. Dude, my dad read a lot of war stuff. Um, I know, I know it was not received very well, but I'd like to watch it again as an adult. Because I watched it when I was a kid when it came out, and uh, I don't remember anything about it, but I'd like to watch it again because I always thought that was a cool fucking name for anything. Clan, Clan of the, the Cave Bear? Bear? Yeah. No, Clan of the Cave Bear. It's just a cool name. It's a cool band name. It's a cool book name, obviously. Dude, why don't cool you name. make a TW fucking album that way, man? <laughs> well, we are, 
I think the rest of our career is pretty much planned out now. So. Oh, shut up. Don't probably, say that. Won't be in there. Fucking Metallica's still making albums. You can do it. And you're only fucking yeah. 20 years younger than those guys. <laughs> yeah, also a hell of a lot poorer, too. Ah, oh, come on, man! This is the age of the fucking internet. You could do anything you fucking yeah, want. Yeah, but we don't have we don't we're not rich enough to just have time to work on music either. Oh, come on! Yeah, it's a hobby for a reason. Yes, <laughs> like this. Yeah, like I said, as ambitious as we are with our ideas, I think the rest of our career is pretty much planned out. Uh, Clan of the Cave Bear concept album probably isn't going to make it, but it might be a good story, Dick Von Doom story album. Story concept uh, EP, it might be in there. Nice. It might be a good Dick Von Doom album. Huh? Might be a good Dick Von Doom album. Maybe. I don't know. We the the, uh, Never Any Story is one of me and Micah's favorites. Um, It's just like the the whole theme of that about just nothing taking over and everything turning to black is is pretty damn pretty intense. Um, Yeah. You know. So yeah. And then you know the Gamork is like an agent of nothing. Yeah, stuff like that, and yeah, it's just really cool. And those that puppet was like freaky as shit, you know. Just kind of stayed with me my whole life, um, dude. Uh, so yeah, I've only, stuff. dude. My sister loved that movie, and the second one, I've only seen them a couple of times. Like, and it's been years since I've watched any of them. Yeah, and uh, I saw a recent post on uh, the the face pages about uh the late their the costume designer still has the fucking uh the dragon Falcor. Falcor, yeah. Yeah. And it's like he's missing like an eyelid and Yeah. <laughs> he's all like fucking breaking down. He looks yeah, all yeah. fucking haggard and fucking <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's cool shit that something like that even exists. But yeah, the whole the whole concept of the never ending story is, is really awesome. I mean a remake could be good if you treat it with like care, but like I think the puppets are what like, kind of made that movie what it is. Well, yeah, and I don't, I don't think, I don't think they'll be able to recapture it. the feel of it with CG. Well, I mean, it's like Yoda. Yeah, Yoda's the exact same way, and Yoda pretty much was the. You know, it's like is for fucking stupid as fucking shit that it is. I mean, like seeing fucking uh, clips on fucking like social media where they're they're doing like outtakes of like Sesame Street and shit and where somebody accidentally cusses on set and they're like and like Elmo the the fucking actor is doing it oh you said a bad word you know like fucking just doing it as Elmo like fucking just like being a character yeah. I mean, shit like that, there's still some fucking kind of magic in. I mean, right. like, even, like, Muppet Treasure Island is still pretty fucking good. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, dude, the, the, uh, um, the Scrooge, the, the Scrooge, uh, Muppets. I oh, yeah. Muppet. Christmas Carol. Um, yeah, that's a good one, too. Yeah. But man. anyway, I think this is a music podcast. It is. So I mean, we've been we talking about a lot here. of movies. <laughs> but no, it, it is a music podcast, but it's all about pop culture and shit, too. It's always been that way. And I was actually going back earlier, and I shared um, earlier this week a video from Belushi Speedball's first time in the Metal Forge, where it was on the radio station. And it sounds right. so fucking different as a show. It's like, I'm like, uh... So what do you guys want to talk about? No, but I'm not like that. But that's the way it feels now to listen to it. It's like I've kind of found a little bit of my voice, right? But, I, I mean, and I dig that shit. And that's what it's all about. So I've always said this is a fucking... This is a fucking conversation podcast. Whether it's in the fucking monologue or in the interview. I mean, it's all conversation. You know, we all fucking tick a certain... You know, we're all musicians, right? So, I mean, that's what it's about. I mean, fuck, man. I'm just having fun riffing, and like even the it, it, what a couple of weeks ago we had a fucking forty minute monologue. Yeah, I remember. And it made the cut, and because it was a good monologue, which is one of the things I wanted to bring back up is back in October we did a double feature on the Metal Forge, where we had to watch a Dolph Lundgren film, and you suggested Command Performance. And I had Kindergarten Cop 2. Yes. Okay. Command performance happened this past week. Uh, not quite. It Almost. Out, and it, it went off the rails, it sounds like. It did. I mean, but like a fucking terrorist attack in a fucking Russian concert. 
Dude, that was fucking the same thing as that movie. But he wasn't the drummer, though. The right, drummer right. saving the day and the fucking, I know you, you're this fucking dude. Right? That didn't happen. But, like, that's fucking wild shit, man. Yeah. Do you think it's weird that, like, they, like ISIS claimed responsibility? Like, I didn't know, like, Russia was an ISIS target. It, like, yeah, I didn't ISIS. either. But, you know, the other thing I think is really weird about that is we apparently warned Russia before this was happening. Because, well, I feel Russia is, like, really cut off from the world now. Except for, like, maybe, like, China communicates with them. Right. And it's like, I don't know. And, it just and, seems and, like, and, uh, how, uh, how North Korea guys, like, does. How do these guys get in there? If you know, I'm sure border security is really tight considering Ukraine is, you know, still in conflict with them. That border is probably locked down. It's like, how, how did they get in there? Was it with like a sleeper cell or did they, like, did they airdrop like, what in? What happened? And like, how did they get caught? I thought like ISIS was all about suicide bombing. Well, why yeah. They, and why, on why top of that, dead? on top of that, how did they do that for one? But I mean, you would think that Russia would have it as a fucking no fly zone. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's just weird. I think that you. ISIS, like yeah, we did that. <laughs> yeah, like, and then, but the guys got caught. All four of them got caught, and like I always thought suicide was their like weapon, like going there with vest, you know, blow it up, or, right? You know, uh, take yourself out in a place of glory when when you're surrounded. Um, so they didn't really, it didn't really seem like their mo to uh, get captured. You know? But the other weird thing about it was too is you noticed that he didn't fucking do anything until the next fucking morning. I mean, I quit. I quit creeping up when I guess when Dolph Lundgren didn't save the day. Uh, it's kind of. Well, yeah. I mean, <laughs> like he, uh, Putin didn't even. <laughs> I shouldn't address, laugh about it. He didn't even address the the incident until the next fucking morning. Like it was like nothing fucking happened. Well, I mean, he's like, well, kind of sucks. News to travels slow out of there. It's all, it's all edited before it leaves the Russian airwaves. So there's really no telling what the timeline really was on that. Sure. You know? Yeah, that's so, true. But yeah, man, com- I mean, almost command performance happening in the news. Almost, so, yeah. Fuck, man. The, and, and what's that old saying? If you could dream it, you could do it. <laughs> yeah. Hey, maybe maybe those guys, maybe whoever was responsible saw that movie and was like, dude. That's a great idea. Tonight. We could totally do this. <laughs> All we got to do is just kill the drummer first and we're fucking scot free. Yes. <laughs> Which is the fucking moral of every story. Just kill the drummer first and we can get off scot free. No, seriously though, in all in all honesty, it is a tragedy. I mean, I know the Russians yeah. citizens aren't responsible for the shit going on in Ukraine. I get it. Yeah, yeah. which is but, terrible. You know, it's like at the same time, you know, I think I think enough time's gone by, but every time I hear about the Great White fire up in like um, New Hampshire or whatever, mm-hmm. yeah, I always think like, man. I can't believe Great White was pulling a crowd that big for that many people to pass. Like it just kind of surprised me. I was like, "Well, and like, that's the thing is like, there's a whole deal about that." Like, yeah. <laughs> in the Ice Hound chat, Jason said that we should have Pyro, and I sent him the link to that story, and he had never heard it. And really? Yeah. That's like a, that's like one of those famous rock and roll stories. I would say that and the, Dimebag getting murdered on stage and yeah. probably like the, the, the Hell's Angels stuff at the Bowling Stone at, concert. Uh, Altamont and Jim Morrison's dick. Yeah, I don't, even, well, I don't know about that one. I'm not a Doors fan. I, I don't pay attention to Jim Morrison. Jesus. Stuff, but, no yeah. fucking class, man. Oh, I got plenty of class. Yeah. yeah. You should have no class like Motorhead. And then, yeah, well, I mean, I don't care about the Lizard King. Let's just put it that way. Oh, come on, man. Was, I mean, Morrison had some good stuff. I'll, I'll make you a believer one day. That was Val Kilmer you're probably thinking of. Uh, no. <laughs> no, because Val Kilmer's greatest role is fucking Batman. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> what is Val Kilmer's greatest role to you? Top Gun? Doc Holliday's probably right there at the top. Uh, ah, yeah. Yeah, they, that's pretty close. Um, probably maybe... Um, that's a great I, dude. I like Heat. Michael Bean in that. He was good in Heat. Really good. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, maybe Iceman. I don't know. Possibly. What What about the Saint? Uh, no. You didn't like that with uh, who's that Elizabeth Shue in that? Uh, I don't remember. I remember the movie. I don't remember if anything really worth writing home about. Yeah, it's like him playing fucking Mission Impossible. Like yeah. right before Mission Impossible came out. Yeah, it seems like there's a there's it seems like there's one really big one I'm, I'm missing that he was in, but I don't remember. I recall it right off hand. So. 
Willow. It's anything, but yeah, yeah, I would say probably. I would Willow. Say probably Mad Mardigan. Oh yeah, yeah, Willow. That was yeah. yeah. Sorry, yeah, <laughs> Willow. That, that, uh, <laughs> that series, that series, they hit the lead on fucking. Uh, kind of push that in my memory, actually. Dude, um, it would have been great if he showed back up in the fucking Disney fucking continuation. Well, nobody would know because they pushed the, they hit the lead on the damn thing. Why just existed? Even though I know it existed. Yeah, I, I watched know. three episodes. It was terrible. Yep, it was. <laughs> It, uh, when they started playing Inner Sandman at the end of that it one episode, bad, yeah. I fucking immediately hit stop. I, yeah, I, I remember like, messaging like, it to you, and yeah, I was like, I was like what who, the fuck is this shit? Yeah, who like picked the music for that, Like knowing it didn't fit? At, uh, if you're going to do music, do the same style as the movie. That's making continuity right. Like you're playing like modern something pop and like modern songs that were hits in a different style. It's like weird as well. Right. Well, see, here's the exact thing is... That's a fucking prime example of something from Metallica not fucking working. So, for every fucking Master of Fucking Puppets in Stranger Things, there's, I guarantee, there's a fucking Inner Sandman in Willow <laughs> that's happening. Uh, what was the other one? Uh, Jungle Cruise. At the beginning of Jungle Cruise, they have a fucking orchestral version of Nothing Else Matters playing. Dude, you're... But it's Disney. Did you actually watch that? <laughs> Dude, I tried. I tried because it's the goddamn rock. Yeah, exactly. Think about what you just said, the goddamn rock. He's so fucking over... Dude, he's not good. He's not a good actor, man. I'm sorry. No, he's not. And, dude, that's like the whole thing now in the fucking wrestling business is the fucking talent's getting pissed at him because he's over here on social media going like, fuck Cody Rhodes and fuck his story and saying like he's a bitch on fucking TV and they can't do it, but he's doing it because he's on the board. Yeah, I mean, like, he was fine, like, when he was coming up back in, like, the... the yeah, in, attitude, in like right. 2000 and yeah, it was good. He he was he was good, but now it's just like his movies are just not. I mean, he's like okay, they, he's made like two billion dollars at box. That's fine, but most of those are Fast and Furious movies, and right. he's just a damn uh, fucking cog in the wheel. Right. So he really didn't make and like his his headlining movies don't don't make very well. I mean, look at any of them. I what think the box is. honestly, not, I think the biggest overseas. one that he's done headline wise right now, I think is like Rampage. Yeah, do you remember that? Do you remember that Die Hard ripoff he did? Uh, yeah, exactly. You don't because it's, I remember wrong. something about it. Isn't <laughs> isn't there one where he's playing like an amputee or some shit? Isn't That's it Die that Hard? One? That's a Die Hard one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And it's like what? It's like what kind of fucking shit is that? Like, yeah, the Scorpion King was Scorpion King sucked. And like he never really did anything. Like he he might have been a guest. He might have started in something that somebody else was in. That one. Well, if you like Fast and Furious movies, I hear I hear his are the best among the best. I don't know. Well, but like his headlining ones, like dude, it's like no. Pick a headlining rock movie and and tell me that it was like a, a critical like or fan success. I get the rundown. Do you what the rundown? I don't even know that, dude. <laughs> so. it, it has uh, Sean William Scott, you know Stifler. Uh, it came out in like 04. It's a very good one. You should watch it. It's okay. it's really good. The rundown. And you can honestly fucking argue his walking tall. But, you know. And those are still fucking 20 almost 20 year old movies. Right. You know, but yeah, on the whole, yeah, he sucks as a fucking actor. I get it. He's just there for fucking action. Yeah. I mean, but on the other hand, I would take the um Stone Cold Steve Austin's uh, movies, uh, even though he was one of the very many, and uh, put them up against the rocks. And I but, think better. but, 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 you, you, you honestly have awesome. you honestly have to dis you you have to disqualify anything Austin did that was attached to a WWE picture, like the Condemned. Yeah. Uh, so any of his roles that he's just been like, but the bad thing about he about Austin is is he's still playing Austin. Yeah, well, he was in the Expendables. Perfect. Right, but he's yeah. still playing Steve Austin, if you get it. Well, I mean, the Rock's still playing The Rock, so... Yeah. Well, he's playing the fucking... The Hulk Hogan version of The Rock, you know? The yeah. one with the, like, fucking Hogan said on the stand that Hulk Hogan had a 10-inch dick, but Terry Bollea didn't, you know? Right. 
shit like that. But anyway, no, um, where was I going with that, you know? Um, on, uh, but there's a rumor out there where the reason why they're doing the Young Rock TV show and all of this shit is airing out his dirty laundry in public so when he goes to be, uh, you know, in his next phase of life running for fucking political office. So, there's that. Uh, well, I think we spent too much time talking about The Rock. I mean, he gets enough attention on his own, I do believe. As I said, yeah. you know, I'm not a Cody fan, but fuck The Rock, you know? Yeah, I don't I don't watch any new modern wrestling anyway. I just watch Ric Flair clips, and that's enough for me. <laughs> Horton, here's a woo! Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> right. Yeah. Dude, um... So we were going to talk about Hell's Heroes. A lot of shit happened. There's, dude. There's so many fucking complaint fucking things. I'm like, the sound sucks on the right side. And um, what did you think of all the all the coverage? I mean, I know you said something about doing a pay per view. Dude, I'll be honest. Like, I'm not. I would. I didn't go there. I've never been to one. But as an outsider looking in, I would say that. I mean, obviously, it's the perfect one for me. There's a few. There's a few reasons uh, besides the lineup. First of all, it's small in comparison, like three thirty-five hundred, maybe five thousand people, which is like pretty small for a fest. That means like you're not fucking just bombarded and waiting in line for Porta Johns or fucking, um, you know. I don't uh, know. Reading some of the stories, it seems. Dude, like- the thing is, everyone fucking complains about something. Like you just can't. Nobody, nobody can just accept well, the facts. Like when there's a lot of people, sometimes things move slow. You know, the but biggest. To be honest with you, I don't think I don't think five thousand people is that bad because. Most shows that you go to the sheds are like eighteen thousand or twenty thousand, so like the big the arena and stuff. Sure. And you see how slow those go. So I mean, five thousand sounds like a fucking cakewalk to me. Well, yeah, but I think the overall the biggest complaint that I saw over and over and over again from people was the merch line. There was a there were three people relegated to selling band merch for every band that had it, except for bands like forbidden you know they had their own merch people uh, right. and some other people had their own like for inside bands but like the outside bands they were like I know Dwayne Eldridge from uh, More Than the Light had said that he had waited in line for over an hour three separate times and never got up to the front yeah but let me ask I mean are you going when the show is over no, apparently this was all day, all three days. Okay. Then it was just I, I, I that there, back. I don't really know. I mean, so I'm sure some complaints might be valid, but I do know as a general, in general, we're like people just like to fucking complain about shit. Well, like, that's true. If you go somewhere and expect fast service when there's that many people, you're kind of fooling yourself. So, also, this is a thing too with this fest. It's a three day fest. There's a pre day on Thursday. And then the actual quote fest is Friday and Saturday. So it's not a Sunday ender. So as of by the time we're recording this, they, they're they just now ending. But the Thursday deal had uh, Adamantus, Savage Oath, Ancient Wisdom, Destructor, Night Demon, Girl School, Hellstar, Doro, Autopsy, and Candlemass. What a right, fucking that's... lineup. Yeah, for for a pre-party. Like, for a just pre- call it day one. Or day zero is even more metal. Yeah, exactly. And it's just like, that would that's my day right there. Yeah, you didn't make it to the fest. You just went to the pre-party. You know? it's like, yeah. And when I, I think of pre-party, I think of like, like a club show. Or something, you know? Yeah, a club show. But there are those two. Don't don't uh, don't forget that like you know midnight played a club night at an after party. Sadistic Force did. Uh, they were all playing. You know there was probably six or so shows after midnight because that's where the shows ended. So then they did after shows until like two or three in the morning. Right. And then you know on Friday you had bands like Entranced, Stitch and Crown, uh, Night. Uh, fucking Solitude, uh, Watchtower, Eternal Champion, Omen, Cauldron, and Queensryche. Dude, I mean, that's not a bad day either. I mean, to see bands like Watchtower, Night, Omen, Cauldron, fucking, I'm not a big Queensryche fan. Uh, Entranced, because, dude, I love those guys. 
fucking uh, Luna and Ben and fucking uh, Feely, super awesome dudes. But uh, yeah, I mean, that fucking Friday lineup is fucking, and I'm just gl- glossing through it and fucking crazy shit. And then fucking Saturday with fucking Early Moods, Bloodstar, Dawnbringer, fucking uh, Necrofire, Witch Hazel, fucking Attic, Traveler, Summerlands, Kirathungle, Tank, Demolition Hammer, Forbidden, Rotting Christ, and Sodom. Dude, that day alone would have been like a fuck all. Because I would have been trying to fucking running back and forth. Yeah, I don't know how far away the indoor and outdoor parts are um, at that place. So They look pretty know, fucking it sounds, close. It sounds very doable, better than like the, the Dan Wimmer ones where it's like, oh yeah, we got five stages all over the place. Like, Jesus Christ, I'm going to fucking die just fucking walking back and forth. Right. You know, unless you're just, one of those people just from the noise the pollution, stages. yeah. You know, just from, that's the whole thing about, you know, we have louder than life here. And yeah, there is a fuck ton of noise pollution, like, in either direction of the deal. That's just like, uh, I think last year, fucking, uh, I don't know if it was at our show or what, but um, somebody was sound checking during Megadeth's set. And it pissed him off. It pissed him off because there was such noise fucking hangover. Oh, was that the one where Judas Priest was, uh, tech was... Yeah, uh, it might have been that. Because, yeah. yeah. And, but um, I don't think that one was ours, though, then. If it was... I think it was overseas, actually. Was it? Jesus, dude. Fucking uh, Mega Dave strikes again. (laughs) Yeah. But, anyway, fucking, I'm gonna try my damnedest to go to seven and see, and I've gotta get down there. Even though I hate fucking Texas now, politically, but, like, there's some friends in Houston that I need to go see that I haven't seen in fucking years. It's probably a decade at this point. You should never hold You should never hold a state in contempt for their politicians. Dude, I know. I know, but, like... <sighs> that shit drives me crazy. Like, um, when um, we had, like, the our last governor had, like, the whole bathroom uh, law thing... It's like all these like famous like I guess like important rock stars like Springsteen and Pearl Jam and all these fucking blowhards. They made it a point to like cancel their tour dates and boycott the state. I'm like, yeah, okay, I get it. But you know what? You also like put a lot of people who are relying on those dates to work in mm-hmm. a fucking bind. And also the people who just like live here and had nothing to do with that shit. Why are you punishing them? So I hate it. I hate when people just like hold the state accountable I mean, for not like, I'd wanting be to glad go. It's just Bruce like, Springs yeah, but canceled. I mean, the people, like the people you're going to see, like are coming from other states and stuff, didn't make these laws. So why are you mad? At why are you like punishing them for something that they had nothing to do? That's like my thing. No, I get that, and you're you're right, and you know it is shitty when it comes down to that stuff. And I know they're not doing anything because you know we're the metal fucking crowd and that's what you know we fucking try to stand up and fucking against you know is that fucking the fucking man mentality you know and but yeah I mean I definitely want to go for seven I've been trying to get down there for a few years I was supposed to go a couple years ago to four and some things that happened and I couldn't make it I ended up going to uh, LA instead that weekend Right. Um, but yeah, I need to get down there. The, the last fucking every year has been a fucking banger with the lineups. And yeah, the lineups are pretty stellar every year. Yeah. Just like when you think, oh, they can't get better than this one. The next year is like, damn, it's it's, it's equal at least. You right. Know, so. Right. Right. It's it's there's there's parts that are better. I think you know it's like holy yeah, shit. Yeah, which this- hazel? Which hazel's first U.S. show is something I would like to see. Actually, That's, you don't really get that. Dude, I wrong, heard so. it was fucking amazing. I probably was, dude. That's a good band. Yeah. I wasn't really high on her last album as much as I was uh, Pentecost. Um, it didn't have... All the songs weren't really um, bangers like Pentecost, but mm-hmm. it was a good album. But, um, but yeah, I, I saw the set list, and, like, they played... They played, like, really all their hits, I guess, or best, or most most accessible ones mm-hmm. for a new audience. So that was a, that was a good set. Well, yeah. It's they they hit do, all their man. albums. 
Yeah. And that's how you do it. That's how you curate the fucking set. And I mean, dude, I, they could have played just off three and had a really good set too. I mean, three is sure. three is a really fucking good album. Right. I, I'm hoping to have them on. We've been in, in contact for the last couple of years, but we've never been able to make it happen. So right. uh, I, I hope to have them soon. And, you know, there's other bands that I hope to have on here, too, like Eternal Champion and everything. We've we tried to make it happen as well. And it's just like, again, it's all scheduling. And hell yeah. But, you know, Urn is a fucking kick-ass band uh, who I have on this week. And fucking, they're on Candlelight Records. So, coming from A Feast on Sorrow, this is The Burden.
All right, metalheads, this week we are being joined from across the pond in the UK with, oh my God, who is it today? It's Joe Nally from Urn. What is up, man? Oh, mate, I've just uh, just had some lunch over here, getting ready for a day of sport, and I'm glad we can finally do this and communication has oh my gosh i know it it is it has been crazy getting this getting this interview on going it's like i i completely forgot and slept through it last time and i was like but we didn't confirm wait no and then Uh, and then it was kind of snake bed after that we tried and tried and just because of the time difference all over the place yeah you know, that's one of the things that I hope uh, people understand. The the work that goes in to producing uh, metal content for the listeners out there is sometimes you got to get up at the ass crack of dawn, like at 1030 in the morning for us metalheads. Uh, <laughs> So, dude, you're you're Come in the UK. Off, yeah. You you're uh your vocals and bass rock the fuck out. Uh, I, nothing like a singing bass player. Uh, shades of Mister Killmister, of course, and so many others. You know, Phil Lennott. Uh, mm-hmm. so, so many awesome uh, UK uh, singing bass players. Paul McCartney comes to mind. You know, uh, mm-hmm. so. How did you get into what chose metal for you? Um, I think with kind of growing up, there was only a few of us when we was really young that were like looking for like more edgy stuff. You know, I kind of started off with whatever went from it went from meatloaf into Bon Jovi, then it went into uh, Aerosmith, uh, then it went into Guns N' Roses. Bon Rises, Jovi, you know. I didn't think we'd ever yeah, mention just, his name on here. You've done a first <laughs> in five well, years. You know, <laughs> being being from a part of like London where like it wasn't really metal wasn't really a thing in where I was from, a place called Streatham, it wasn't really a thing. And so you're mm-hmm. learning, you're finding your own kind of path. And then it kind of went like maybe Nirvana. And then I remember I went around a friend's and his older brother played me Metallica one. Mm. They played me the second half first. And he's like, guess how, the, guess how the first half sounds. And I was like, I don't know. I was like, whatever, 12. I was like, I don't know. How does it, how does it sound? And he was like, sounds like this. And that was it. That was literally like, right. Okay. I've now found this band and this, this is literally going to change my life for the better. And there was, I say me and one of my mates and uh, he was a bit more into punky stuff. I was into metal and he'd come to a metal show just so it meant that I weren't going on me Todd and I'd go to a punk show, you know? Um, likewise, same for him, like that he was on his own. Then we moved and we went to our next school in a different town and there was just metal heads and punk kids and grungers, you know, all that sort of stuff. And it just opened up a whole world and it was just like, yeah, you like Metallica? Have you heard of Exodus? And it was just like, no. Well, Kirk used to be in Exodus. And I was like, give me some Exodus. Yeah, it's like, let me so fucking pay- hear it. <clears throat> yeah. You know, and that's one of the things I think that is as much as people bash and shit talk Metallica. Um, and I've had my fair share of that as well through the years. You know, I've I've been a fan of their entire career, and there for a time I was trying to not mention their name on the show a lot because I feel so like, uh, you know, like they're I kind of have this feeling like to a degree they take away from bands like yours that could be playing midsize halls and shit, and like be pulling in a decent amount of people, but because they're pulling in a like set like. Three hundred and fifty dollar tickets for the weekend. It kind of fucks everybody else because then you don't yeah, have your, yeah. you know, your twenty. You know, it's hard to fucking scrounge out your fucking twenty pounds to go to the pub for the fucking show and beer and everything mm-hmm. when you pay mm-hmm. three hundred to see a band like that. But what I will not discredit from them is they have been an amazing gateway band 
for so many people yeah. because of their mainstream yeah. success and and ability and everything they have introduced so many bands to like you said exodus or you know mm-hmm. as it is um i don't know fuck it, anybody you know possessed even you yeah. know yeah. just uh, whoever yeah. and, it's you know and and to this day getting getting people into music is really still where it's at so I just wish it the the economy wasn't fu- fucking shit around the world. <laughs> but we can't. Yeah. We're just sim- uh, simple people. But one of the differences I want to ask about is the school system here versus there. You said when you uh, when you heard Metallica, you were twelve years old, and the next year you all went to completely different schools, and you fucking were inundated with metalheads. Now here in America, yeah, yeah, yeah. unless you go to like a private school, you most of the time don't have to wear uniforms. Did you all have uniforms in your schools? Yeah, yeah, I had I had to wear like a suit. Ugh. And, so uh, jacket and, ta- yeah, and, and and slacks. I, it was good. It it was good, like because because I I was um was really good and represented the school at sport. You could wear a normal tie. You could wear like a plain maroon tie. And you wouldn't realize that was associated with the school. So a couple of us lads who were like a bit bigger and whatnot used to take the t- like the tie off, do the buttons on, and just go to the pub during a free lesson or going on our lunch, we just go to the pub. And on Fridays, our school used to finish at 11.30. Yeah. So a couple of me and like the football lads with boom, 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 looked like we were just working in our suits. And a couple, you had to get the right ones. Like, you're six foot, you've already got a beard, like, you can come, you can come. <laughs> and a bit yeah, you couldn't us. take we're, fucking... We're, we're, you couldn't take Tom, yeah. who fucking has, like, one fucking mustache hair out there. I mean, you'd get your yeah. asses kicked out immediately. <laughs> Oh yeah, totally. So that was it. That's how we had to kind of pick who who was going to come with us. And um, but yeah, it was fu- it was funny. It was, you know, it was, it was a completely different world, like from where I kind of grew up. And then I say, if it wasn't my my mates, that older brothers would be into metal, and that's how we kind of like, oh fucking hell, does this band was Slipknot, and it's like, oh my god, they do this and they do that, and it's like, dude, I remember oh, saying that really when they scary. were puppies. I remember yeah. seeing them when they were puppies in 1999, and it was just like, oh, hey, dude. He's like, yeah, my Mick, I play guitar. I'm like, oh, hey, dude, what's up? You know, uh, second yeah. stage at yeah. OzFest, yeah. And then and then seeing yeah. the, the shit that would happen with them, you know, in a couple short years, crazy. But no, that was one of the things I, I've always, I've never really asked. I've had a, a ton of uh, UK guests on before, but I've never really asked that because here in America, like I said, unless you're in a private school, you don't have... Uh, yeah. Uh, you have a dress code and shit, of course. Like, you can't have fucking sleeveless yeah. shirts and all that shit, right? But, like, yeah, I mean, you could wear your, your fucking Iron Maiden shirt to school. And, you know, as long as it wasn't Eddie, like, giving the finger to somebody yeah. or yeah, yeah, chewing yeah. somebody's head off or some shit, they didn't care. And, yeah. and I think that's still one of the things about, you know, that I still remember from my day of like, and I didn't even have like the the back in the day feelings of like, uh, hey, you always heard bands talk about like drawing on their notebooks and shit like that. That mm-hmm. I was kind of the end of that. And, and I just, uh, did you all do that? Were you all drawing fucking logos on your notebooks and stickers yeah. and, and all kinds of shit? Yeah, yeah, and it was like you'd put like on your rucksack Tipex, your your favorite band's name, and mm. you know, and there was like the kid who come into school and he'd heard of Slipknot, but he left the K out, so it was Slipknot. Oh yeah, and it was just uh, like oh, <laughs> you know, it's like, like poser, well, poser, it's funny, up, you know. <laughs> we have a band here in Louisville, Kentucky, and that's where I'm based out of is the Midwest. We have a band here who performed the same night as Slipknot did at a festival show that we have. And it was just but just by shitty booking that they, they lined up with each other. And no, their crowds really wouldn't fucking, uh, uh, you know, they wouldn't cross over too much. But they actually took on the stage as slip hyphen not N O T. (laughs) And that was just like two years ago. (laughs) Yeah. So yeah, Yeah, totally. That was was the one I remember it. Well, yeah, definitely. Oh, look at at his back. Look at his backpack. It's got slip not. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. 
It's like, uh, check out this fucking person. <laughs> um, so when, okay, so you were 12 years old, you got into metal. Is is that when uh-huh. you picked up the guitar or the bass and you just went went to town? Or, or was it, or were you a vocalist primarily first? How did you, what did, uh, what, what happened to uh, make you you today? Uh, so I started playing in a, in a garage band with a friend and I was a drummer, never played drums in my life. Yeah. And I look back at it now and, uh, a, f- a friend, a bit slightly older, was like, I've got a drum kit to sell to you for a tenor. So for those who don't know, a tenor is like $15 and it had whatever, I hope it was like fucking a four piece drum kit with like three cymbals. And now I look back on it and realizing that he definitely stole it. Um, but I didn't have any stands, so we were playing in the garage, and I wanted to be like Nick Menza, so I would tie the symbols <laughs> to the like things yes. in the garage. And the problem is, you'd be playing, and you hit one, but because it's on rope, it fucking swing. Yeah, across. <laughs> it and swings. Like, nice. Yes, that's rad so as shit. It, that that's how that's how I learned, and it was just like just it was just to be in a band, and then. Um, uh, then again, a friend was like, "Oh, we need a bass player for my band." And I was like, "Yeah, and I play a bit, a bit of bass." And I had a, I had a guitar. Never took any lessons or anything. I just wanted to learn how to play like riffs. And um, again, I got my, I got my bass uh, by a way, uh, which was for, for you know, a bit of a, a, a sneaky backdoor method. Um, I still have it. Um, we never knew who it was, but I didn't, I didn't. Do the dirty deed, but somebody, but somebody, my did. music department is. Yeah. So, do you music still use it? School might have lost the bass. Do you still use that bass? No, no, no. So now it's so now it's, so it's, now it's just in the vault. Lost. It's in the vault. It's yeah. there for sentimental value. Yeah. You know, that's one of the things so. that I've always thought was really cool. Apparently, uh, we were talking earlier about those guys. And apparently they're like Metallica are really bad about that. They're like, like they don't sell shit. Like the shit that gets away, yeah. like they'll put out a call for stuff. Like, Hey, send us your yeah. pictures and ticket stubs. But like the, apparently like they're an archivalist band. Like they do, they keep yeah. and do everything. Like all the guitars that they've ever had, they keep. It's like, yeah. I dig that. I wish I still had some of my first ones. But you do dumb things yeah. like you smash them on stage, um, and that, that sucks. shit sucks. I, I used to collect all merch. I used to collect. I have one of every T-shirt, and I haven't done that for. Um, I'm like, I prefer that T-shirt that I've got to, in my wardrobe to go to a fan who really wants it. Yeah. So I'm kind of, I'm kind of separated that, um, and I feel like if I missed out on one piece, there's no point in having the rest. So. Um, yeah, that's how I feel about it. But yeah, so I've still got some old guitars, and I've donated um, old equipment to some uh, some primary schools, like kids' schools around here, so they can use they can use my old equipment. Dude, and, that's fucking you know, helps amazing. Out their music. So it's me giving back to schools what I took from schools. Um, Dude, so yeah, that's my part. Fuck yeah. yeah, man, that is amazing, and. Honestly, you know, I, I kind of had a realization the other day. Well, I say the other day. It's been a couple of months ago. I played a show with said Slip hyphen Not band a while back. And they almost primarily play all ages shows. And uh-huh. here in the States, that's a thing. Because, you know, we can't go into bars and stuff. And, and uh, even a lot of places you can't even perform until you're 21 years old. Yeah. So... With all ages shows and stuff like that, and pub, playing the pub scene and doing things over there, how do you all? I mean, how do you all reach new listeners other than like? I mean, do you all do a lot of all ages things? I mean, what's the what's the the standard over there? I, I feel bad. Like, I mean, a lot of things now. If it's more, if it's you got a lot of venues which are pubs, but upstairs mm-hmm. or out the back, they might have a venue. Those are usually 18. The things for actual proper venues, O2 run venues, like actual legit venues, usually it's 14 plus. Any younger, which it's with an adult. Um, but obviously pub venues, pub slash venues out the back or upstairs, that's 18 plus. Yes. 
Which um, is is drinking age up. there? Sorry? What is, what is your legal drinking age? Uh, eighteen. Okay, so yeah, that would explain why they were be eighteen up. Yeah, cool. Oh yeah, totally. And uh, it's um, but I mean, growing up, I feel like I never never had any issues. It was like, but there was a great venue near where I lived that we all used to go. And then one weekend, they made it eighteen plus for everything. And I was lucky because I, I knew the guy so well that it kind of didn't matter to me. And it killed the venue. A place called the Kingston Pill. It killed the venue. Wow. It went from being all ages and mate, like, not that I was a fan, but one week you could go there and bring me the horizon of pain to 150 people. You could go there and then just be like, wow. And it could be someone else, like, you know, whoever bands architects who are massive now. And then on weekend, boom, you had to be over 18 and you're not coming in. And the venue was gone within two, two years. Oh, wow. It went from being a heartbeat and thriving to nothing. Um, so I feel like there's a fine line of it, but, um, yeah, it hasn't, hasn't affected us yet. We've been okay. pretty lucky with what we've been doing show wise and what have you. Sure. So, um, I'd, I'd be bummed out. Like I'd be bummed out if we were some 14, 15 year old person's favorite band and they didn't get a chance to see us because they, they didn't hit the limit. I'd end up going outside meeting them tell, saying that I was their dad. And bringing them in that's that's the sort of person i am well like, oh, this is my kid you know what i mean they can come in and watch the show right uh, we try to cater we try to cater for for stuff you know we do try our best um so yeah that's that's the age limit over here definitely and obviously with ours being a couple of years three years more it makes it even harder uh for for yeah. bands for bands that, you know, where the guys might be in their late 30s or early 40s to be able to bring people out to a show other than their their friends, you know? And and yeah, let's yeah. face it, when people are in their 30s and 40s, they like to slow down a little bit and spend time with the kids and everything. And they start taking mm-hmm. they start taking tradition more uh more into into heart. Speaking of tradition, uh tea time. Uh-huh. Are, you, are you? Do you fancy tea? Tea? Uh, it's weird. <laughs> it's a weird question because over over here, tea time to me, tea time is is what we, I guess you guys would call dinner, right? Okay. In America, yeah, so like yeah. lunch. But other people, yeah, yeah, like it, it's weird. But I, I am a tea guy, a traditional tea. Mm-hmm. It's a, it's a. I don't see the Americans. You guys, you don't. You're not big on the tea, are you? Uh, You're missing out. Yes and no. See, here in America, we're we're a little bit di- we're divided because in the South we have tea drinkers that are sweet tea, which well, okay, they yeah, like. Yeah. They drink you drink over ice, uh, and and it's yeah. got and it's sugar and it's fucking sweet. Like oh my god, cavity uh-huh. inducing fucking sweet tea. It's great. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. It's not great for me <laughs> because I'm diabetic, but it's great. Uh, and then, like when you you catch a line uh, about midway through Indiana, people start drinking their tea with no sugar and, well, okay, and drinking yeah, yeah. just regular black tea, no sugar, but they will add their own sweetener to it, so it's not like super fucking southern sweet tea or whatever they call it but for me no i love like a a a great earl gray or a great herbal tea anything like that but i i was talking to uh a few years ago and this is where i i thought of this and and brought it up um the dudes and seven sisters toured america and we were talking about it and i was just like you know how do you all take your tea? Because I've all, I've tried tea with milk, and oh uh, my god, uh-huh. no! I like I'm drinking coffee right now because it's ten in the morning here, and like, but no, I can't do the milk. Do you do milk in your tea? Have to, you have to. But I, you have to. But it's kind of like it right. Vegemite. It, it's kind of like Vegemite. It's just a, just uh-huh. a beep, a little blip. Not not a lot. You can't have... It's a splash yeah. just to change the color. That is it. That is all you need for me. Um, and I will take a little dab of 
a little dab of brown sugar, and that, oh is, my that is it. Ah, uh, I'm that, gonna. That's... I've got some Earl Grey in the in the in the uh, in the kitchen. <laughs> I think I'm gonna do that this afternoon. I'm gonna chill out and and probably watch some football along with you all because you were talking a minute ago about you're here for the yeah. you're here for the NFL playoffs. Holy shit, dude! Yeah, yeah. Do yeah. Are, are you so, like? Uh, do, uh, is your team still uh, in? No, long gone. Uh, long gone. Uh, it's, uh, I'm a Chargers fan, so okay. that's gone. Okay, yeah. Uh, um, I, yep, my, long my gone. Friend who's next to me is, my friend who's next to me is a Packers fan. I see that. I see so that green. I don't know if he can hear me or not, but I see that fucking Packer green on his on his yeah. toboggan up there. <laughs> yeah, he's got his beanie on. Good spot. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, but tonight, you know, we're uh, it's hard because the late game, obviously, it's late over here, so I'll probably only catch half. But yeah, when we was uh, we recorded in New York, and we went to see Giants versus Texans, and it was so bizarre because the first nine days we were there, it was so lovely and warm. Walking to the studio, and this is the hard thing of America: your your jarred coffee is is not very good. It's your charred coffee is not very good. So the first week we'd walk to the studio, we'd get a coffee from this place with like an egg and cheese, sweet bread, fucking breakfast sandwich, have a smoke, get to the studio. And then the second nine days overnight, it was like a cold snap. And I was having a bad time. Oh my God. We went to the NFL and everyone's having the tailgate. And I was just like, that was like, you're loving it. The, um, you guys are just them New Yorkers are used to that weather I was there like I feel sick because of how cold it is and um, I wish I could it was the most American thing if I ever think of America it was what I saw because it was Veterans Day oh wow and I've never felt I'm not American I've never felt so passionate about something in my life nice and I was like this is the best shit ever <laughs> and um <laughs> They was like, in one corner, they was just like, today we have Sergeant John Smith. He served in the 2nd Battalion, blah, blah, blah. And the whole family are there. And everyone's just like, yeah, yeah. And he went, we got another surprise. The dog he served with, Lassie, she's here. And a camera pans to the other <laughs> side of the pitch. There's the dog running across the pitch. I'm crying. And it was like, I'm at USA. USA. <laughs> the dog's running. That's and fireworks great. went off, mate. I was like, what gets, oh, my God. You know, that's interesting, so though. You say that you weren't used to the New York cold, which, you know, on the when you turn the globe around, I mean, the UK is just a slightly bit higher up in in the, in the uh, what, longitude lines? Yeah, uh, I mean, it's really So you would be, today. like, closer to the North the North Pole than New York uh-huh. is, but I guess it just doesn't get as as cold there? I mean, next to New York, you've just got hundreds of miles of Canada and the sea. And you've got- <laughs> you have hundreds of miles of I frozen mean, Canada coming in, try- beating at the door. Yeah. Let me in! <laughs> it's rough. But, like, today, I moved out of London. I now move, I live next to the sea, and it's chilly but mm-hmm. it's, it's beautiful the sun's out and that's perfect as a as a red-headed male that's perfect <laughs> for me so i can sort of get burnt and cooled down at the same time <laughs> i agree <laughs> i'm the you same know, way but it's it's uh yeah but i knew i was not ready i remember we walked out and i was walking my drummer left after nine days so it's just me and our guitarist and i was like oh my god like what the fuck <laughs> has happened here <laughs> And um, yeah, it it surprised me. Of course, so, uh, yeah, yeah it, that crazy. that shit. If you're not used to it, and see, I've actually never been to New York State as an adult. Uh, I went as a kid okay. with my dad because he drove a semi truck as a kid when I was growing up. So I went up there with him for, for like on a trip for that, but I, nothing to, to visit. And so I need to make that trip back. <laughs> I've been everywhere fucking else. I just. It's like I think it's the people, honestly. It's like I don't I don't think I'm ready for the people. It's weird because we recorded in Brooklyn, and Brooklyn's really like where I kind of reminds me of where I grew up. Um, and I, I felt absolutely fine with it. And I was, I was like, yeah, this this is cool. Um, the one thing that really stunned me 
is how expensive New York is. Now, as an Englishman, like the fact that the dollar is almost the same as a pound now yes. is insane. And when I had to pay, it was like a box of cereal, and there was like a, le- a box of cereal, it was like eleven dollars. I was like, "That's not right. Mm-hmm. That's literally that's 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 insane." And, and that's the and, problem yeah. with New York and New Jersey and the port city like that because everything is so fucking ridiculously expensive. And yeah, yeah, I mean, so honestly, in a band level, if you're getting you're, I mean, independent bands, I mean, you're lucky if you get a hundred fucking bucks at a show sometimes, you know, we've all <laughs> been there. We've all played shows like that. And yeah, we've, we, mm-hmm. you know, as we've progressed in, you know, doing and getting bigger, bigger payoffs and shit. Uh, but like, it's like, that'd be like getting 10 fucking dollars for a show there to play. And it, it, it's harsh, you know, because it, it's usually about th- three times any it, as expensive as it is here in the Louisville area. So we've got a, about a million people here to their 10. Mm-hmm. To their 10 million. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Course. And it's it's insane. Yeah. And But anyway, <laughs> we've talked a lot about just whatever. Uh, we're here actually to talk about A Feast on Sorrow, the latest album. Um, uh-huh. Eight songs from Candlelight Records released August of last year. What, I mean, since coming out with it, I love the cover and both albums that you've done, I've loved the artistic direction of. I will say that. But Thank you very much. The, the Great Wave is amazing mm-hmm. because I, it's almost what what is it? Is it Faramir who uh, and and this is for the nerds out there? It's Faramir who has the dream, not Eowyn in Lord of the Rings, about standing on the shore and seeing a great wave flood and take mm-hmm. out humanity and shit. So, mm-hmm. what what does the the album mean to you? Like, I mean, I can sort of tie that with... It's a very emotional album um, due to its subject matter. And I think with the wave, you know, you kind of get them big crushing waves of grief and emotion that come over you. Mm -hmm. And a big... Talking as your reference is there, you get them... It it has such an ability and power to destroy. And it's natural. It's not... not, And it gives life. It's not a... Yeah. It's not a human destroying a, a thing. It's like the illness, it's just a natural thing and the power of it. So it's just tying in slight bits and bobs to tie like slight moments, like kind of references that you could tie that artwork into the album's uh, subject. And I think it just looks amazing. In a time when a lot of metal artworks look the same, Mm -hmm. I like that we used someone who doesn't do it for metal bands, doesn't do it for bands. She's topping what she does. She's never done anything music related, and we managed to get her. The piece is called Behemoth, as well. So I thought that was quite fitting. That That's is what the piece is called, and uh, yeah, and I just look at it, and it feels powerful. And I just think the yeah. look, the color scheme, ties perfectly with the album, with the music. It does, and to take a from an album setting. When it comes to, um, like, like you said, uh, with doing picking an artist that doesn't have any uh, any ties to music or anything like that, uh, mm. and then you basically have taken all color out of the album, at least by the cover, anyways. Mm-hmm. So. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, with that, and and it, it's an amazing photograph because even in black and white, you see so much detail from the mm-hmm. the mist coming off of the of the crescending wave, and so when you take all color out of things like that and just produce it bare bones, is that the idea behind the album as well? It's just bare. It's it's bare bones. It's 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 mm-hmm. me. Uh, us as a band doing our thing. Yeah, I feel like with with it again taking out all the color. I feel like the album is a very cold, very hard hitting punch, of just a, an emotion. And with with it, we just we just we're just three lads who want to write 
our music. We don't want uh, ourselves to be tied into anything. It's just about the music and stripping everything away and just having an album artwork like that with no color scheme. You wouldn't know what it was. You wouldn't know what the band sounded like. I would see that and go, that looks powerful. That looks important. I want to know what is in this record. I want to know what is what this band is. And um, I, I feel like it was a really good move. Whereas the album before has got orange and reds. And I feel like the, there was a bit more of a warmth to that production in them songs. So it kind of slow, everything sort of ties in. But with this one, where the album is so hard hitting, really raw, it's not, you know, we don't, it hasn't been overproduced. It's all very natural. And I think it all ties in nicely. Um, and if I was to listen to it whilst looking at the artwork, it would make complete sense. For sure. You know, and and with the artwork too, I will sit there and say is I when I saw the artwork and I had and I had seen uh the cover uh and heard a couple of songs from Serpent and Spirit and I was like, I dig these guys. And then when I saw the new album release on and I saw it on uh now X, uh, I got. I guess we all got to get in the na- get in the habit of saying X and not Twitter. I don't know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> keeping up with uh, modern modern society. Uh, and I saw it on X, and I was just like, "Wow, man, this is amazing!" And I and that's when I made I listened to it, and and I was just like, "Wow, holy shit!" It's like I really need to have you all on because as as it is, yeah the it does make perfect sense. And one of the cool things that I do here in the Metal Forge is, as you can see behind me and people have seen on video, you see I put up a lot of shit because it's a, hey, it's a metalhead room, right? It's just like it would be in a practice space. There's stickers on the wall. There's there's posters. There's all that shit like we all did when we were 12. <laughs> but mm-hmm. coming yeah. in and leaving my room here, I have a uh, a Japanese poster of the Great Wave. Uh-huh, at, yeah. at the door, yeah. at the door, because is the way I see it is coming in and leaving. You are cleansed and absolved of everything, and that's mm-hmm. why I, when I saw the album cover, I immediately thought that. And in in further listening, I was just like, "Wow, this means a fucking lot!" And hell yeah, yeah, thank you. So, uh, Cheers, man. before we switch over to derailed, I do want to ask one other question about the band, and it is. How in the fuck, out of all of the bands in the world, some, I, I know on, let's see, on, uh, let, I could go to the, uh, the metal archives and there's some fucking like eight or 10 million bands listed on there out of however many bands in the fucking natural world since the, uh, advent of rock and roll in the 1950s to metal today, how did you get the fucking name Earn before anybody else. <laughs> and I understand you spell it Saxon. You spell it like the Anglo Saxon, where it's with an E. Yes, because yeah. in America, there's no E. Like there's no U in yeah. color like there is there. Yeah. Uh, so there, the, the Americanized English difference. But how out of every f- Black Sabbath, Fucking Jethro yeah. Tull, Elvis fucking Presley, Uriah Heep, Earn. And you guys, fucking, it, it's like it's perfect. Yeah, the one, the one thing, obviously, it looks like urine if you look at it very quickly. Yeah, but, there um, is that. In the UK, it's also spelled the same way as, as you guys. But for the most parts of the world, it's with an e, um, and it also has double double meaning. In like in France, it also it means a funeral funeral urn, right? But it also means a ballot box. A voting box. Okay, I didn't so know that. It means two different things. So it's like so when we're touring, put it in the urn. When and we're go. touring France, yeah. But when we're touring France soon, if you see the poster, people are going to be like, "Oh, urn," or does that mean there's a ballot box? <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't know. Um, so I guess it does funny. have a double-edged sword. <laughs> yeah, but it's most of the world it is, and it's really cool going to different countries and hearing who pronounces it the best. And uh, so I thought the Italians were going to make it sound really like sexy and good, and it just it wasn't. It was really squeaky and high. Um, the Germans, it sounds powerful. 
the Nordics. It obviously sounds powerful. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's weird how some places be it the same word, they just pronounce it completely different. But I, um, yeah, um, we used it, and then a bloke contacted us, going, a German guy, going, I am so gutted. I've never used thought about using this as my band. My band <laughs> and I was just like, mm, yeah, cheers. Uh, well, I do know on uh, it, it's very interesting because on the metal archives, when you spell it, you are any like you all do. There are only three bands that come up, and they are all European bands. So that makes sense, yeah. at least. At least it's not some jackass American doing it, trying to be clever, yeah, no, <laughs> like we do. Yeah, no, um, I'm pretty happy with it. Yeah, it's great. It is a great name. I mean, th- there's bands, and then there's bands that just have great fucking names. You know? <laughs> and you. Earn, to me, is a great name. Uh, like Celtic Frost is, or as some people yeah. say, Celtic Frost. Uh, yeah, yeah, either yeah. or is a great fucking name. Let's just face it. I mean, mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. not everything can be as awesome as Uriah Heep. No. <laughs> as a name. I mean, great music. <laughs> I just don't, I don't care for their name. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, uh, I, can, I can totally feel that. Definitely. So derailed. Let's switch over to derailed. Derailed is all about you as a person. We've talked about you a lot already, but um, these are usually five random questions about uh, whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you were packing a care package for an enemy, what would you put in there? A care package for an enemy. Um. Oh God. I it depends on how bad they treated me or <laughs> right. how bad they are an enemy. And if they're a really bad enemy who's really done me bad, real- I you're an American channel and I'm gonna base this that I'm over there. Are you- In the care package it would have a note just telling them what they've done, why they're my enemy, and I would probably put a little you know, give them a choice. Like I feel like I'd, I'd give them a choice in that letter. Never see me again. Maybe a little tube, you know, like Matrix, a red or a blue pill, <laughs> you know? Yeah. One of them you don't have to see me again, or one of them you don't get to see anyone again if you're my enemy. And if you've done me bad, really bad. You don't even get really, the choice, really right? <laughs> yeah. You have a choice. Never see me again, or never see anyone again. Dude. But that, this is it. That's you know, as an, if this is from, uh, if I was living in America, over here, it would just be, I'd probably end up shaking her hand and going, I was the out of order one. Yeah, you know right, I mean? right, right, right. <laughs> no, man, it was me. I was I, wrong. I, no, we're good. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Uh, uh, one of the listeners I had asked that question to as well, and I do like to do this sometimes, and she said she would just leave a picture of herself so, she, so that whoever knew knew who was fucking them over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I've got time for it. And my reply to that was, if I was to be that guy and I wanted to pack a care package for my enemy, I would pack nothing but prepackaged expired food. <laughs> Just to be I an feel asshole. Like I've gone much darker. I feel like I've gone down a horrible route. <laughs> if you could bankrupt any one person or company, who would it be? Well, I feel like. He's almost gonna be bankrupt. Um, I mean, I've, it'd be kind of good to see Donald Trump completely humbled. Um, so I uh, agree, you know, just because. Um, oh God, there's so many people that could be. I mean, our government over in the UK. Fucking hell! I know. <laughs> I mean. So, like, on a, on a level scale here, when you so, all are watching the news uh, and you see all the American news pop up, what it's like, what do you all say? What's the first thing that comes to your mind when you see American news on your TV? I, I, it is literally like, God bless, because I've got a lot of American friends. It is like, they are absolutely mental. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean? it is. It's like, the, yes, we are. And, oh... <laughs> <laughs> I try yeah. not to talk too much politics on this show because it is my escape. But oh yes, you are yeah, completely yeah, yeah. right. We are fucking mental. Uh, which risks <laughs> did you take younger? 
which risks did you take younger and how did they pay off? See, they're not all just silly it's, questions. It's, it's weird as it sounds. I wish I took more risks. Mm. I think I was scared to take risks. I've only started taking risks the last five years, a bit more of a no care attitude. I think as a kid, I played it pretty safe um, because I didn't want to upset parents and I wanted to follow this and that. And that didn't get me anywhere. It just got me living a sort of basic, boring life. Like yeah, they're already things. upset. No. <laughs> yeah. But now, so I kind of maybe as a kid, I played it. I played it pretty safe, and I, I know it's like a an, an, an easy question to, to kind of to to kind of answer. But I, off the top of my head, I don't feel there's a, a risk. But I feel like my my choices later on in life have been my risks. Definitely, um, I had many friends who took risks growing up, and it, some of it, re- it could be anything stupid. It could be our uh, one mate was like left school early, started up a, a gas fitting engineering company. He now owns a football stadium, you know, and but I had another friend who took a risk about walking home on a train track one night. Sadly, the worst happened. So I never did any of that. I would be like, I'm not going to walk on a train track home. I'm going to go and get a bus. Do you right. know what I mean? Or I'm going to walk home. I would do that. I wouldn't have the guts to leave school and start, start up a gas company. Now walking down the, you know, 10, 15 years down the line, that guy's worth shitload of money. Right. And in, you know, I never did any of that. I played it really safe. But now the later on, I've kind of got my life in check. Now I'm taking risks. Definitely. And because the band's, the band's doing well. So now I'm taking more risks for that. So other than, other than the bloke that you were just talking about, uh, with, with left school and did the, uh, the gas company and the, all mm. that and worth, crazy amount of money did you ever go to school with anybody else famous that you that like that we would see in the metal metal and rock world today or do you do you have any predecessor that you that you went to the same a bit younger than us is tom holland who plays spider-man yeah for sure um uh i'm trying to think no i don't think there's anyone that i went to school in my year that I'd be like, oh, that person. There's people above. There's some famous kind of actors and comedians. And there's obviously Tom Holland, who's a bit, you know, a few years below. But off the top of my head, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be, you know, I'm sure they've, yeah, there's a few sure. that have done really well. Yeah, but, absolutely. Uh, like, you you know, you, always, so you far, always hear the stories of like Beverly Hills High type shit where all these actors went to the same high school or whatever, you know. And it's it's always yeah. nice to see who uh, we, uh, where I went to school, we had a Major League Baseball player that uh, went mm-hmm. to our school. Uh, he played for the Orioles. His name was Bradley Pennington uh, in the, in the oh, late okay. 80s, early 90s. So he was a, about a... Uh, about 15 years ahead of me he was actually more in my brother's oh, okay. my brother's class of people so uh, do you feel that large scale conspiracies are actually a thing or would it ju- or would it would it fall apart a large scale conspiracy oh, god that the word conspiracies would to do with anything i'm like but i, I I'm, over here I think the worst thing about any conspiracies, I don't know, I don't know to what term you're kind of saying it with. Like, okay, the word conspiracy, the, the biggest thing that's happened in the last few years is obviously COVID. So sure. I know being, you know, that I've had mates who talk about the most bizarre stuff. Who I've got, I, won't, I don't want to say a name in case you listen. He believes it was something put in a TV and they were putting it out through the TV. That sounds like uh, the president, <laughs> the former president. I don't know. Yeah. It sounds like you're and, shots fired. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh and I was gosh. just like, oh, yeah. And he's just like, yeah, don't trust them. That's what they're doing. And I was like, but you own a TV. Yeah, no, but it's something I have to live with. <laughs> you know, that's just what like somebody who uh, 
I know somebody who used to do that conspiracy theorist thing where, yeah, I understand hacking is real and people can hack into your fucking laptops and shit, but like, yeah. oh no, like as soon as, as soon as she opened up a laptop, she took the duct tape and covered the camera up. It's like, I'm not going to use that ever. And it's like, fuck. It's yeah. like, yeah. And, uh, again, I, I mean, God bless, but. I feel like America is a great place of conspiracy. <laughs> it is. Uh, Dude, yeah, check out yeah. Jesse Ventura. Check out Jesse yeah, Ventura, yeah, the, yeah. For, the wrestler, former governor of Minnesota. Uh, yeah. He, he has so Ventura. many awesome fucking conspiracy theories. They're great. And, and I love it. And uh, my broadcast partner, it, Jason, uh, he loves the, the Jesse, the body Ventura. You know, I like doing the voice when I do it. <laughs> That's a good impression. Dude, I have one more question, but before we go today, uh, I do want to say thank you. This has been a blast. This has been awesome. Uh, you know, you, you, you had said uh, moving next to the beach, being a uh, a, a, a redhead, fair-skinned ginger persuasion. I feel you, dude. I'm the same way. Uh, burn. Yeah. yeah, millions of freckles here, too. Uh, I've covered a lot of them up with tattoos these days. Um uh, as always, links are listed below, so please give a like, a share, and a follow. Uh, they're everywhere. They're on social media. They do have Bandcamp, uh, but you can't get the new album on Bandcamp. You actually have to go through Candlelight, I believe, or your web store. Yeah. Um, do you have any shout-outs or other things you want to promote that you want to tell people well, about today? In, in March, we're heading off on tour with the band Avatar. Yes. Um, who who are extremely big and I didn't realize and I met them the other night they invited me down to an event they were doing extremely nice guys Jesus yes. oh, really, really, I'm really looking forward to it um, and it's our first time playing so we we have quite a connection to France because we're connected to, to Gajira who are from France but we've never played it mm. so this is our first time going to France and this yeah it looks the cities look beautiful. So we're going out of Avatar doing that, and we've got a lot of festivals. The one thing I really want to try and, and sort out is we we sell a lot of merch, CDs, vinyls, T-shirts, whatever, to America, like a lot. Now, obviously, the cost is an issue, shipping. I want to speak, try and sort out something with our management where we can get a store set up over there Yes, and absolutely. Ex exclusive, different prints because we sell an awful lot to America, all over America, and it's really great to see. And I mean, it's 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 promising. You know, it's exciting. So I want to try and get something set up there. Like over here, we have a company called Empiricon, which sure. covers um, Europe. Um, so I don't know. It's something that we have to sort. But I'd like to have um, select designs that you can only get there as an American fan of buyer and it saves, obviously the cost won't be as much and you'll get it quicker and customs won't be an issue. So there's something I need to look into. So we're definitely, um, we're definitely thinking about stuff like that. Definitely. Hell yeah. Um, dude, Joe, thank you so fucking much for coming to the metal forge today. This has been a kick-ass conversation. I have enjoyed it. Uh, waking up early for these sometimes really kicks fucking ass. If you could choose your last words, what would they be? La Zurich was right. Oh, 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 oh. I'm just gonna leave it on that. I'm not. I don't want any any explanation. Boom. He said it. I didn't. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> On our way out today, Joe. Thank you so fucking much. This has been awesome. On our way out from the new album, what do you want to play? Um, I play. I'd like to play "Become in the Ocean." I think that's a really easy, fun song to get into. Shit, yeah, man. You heard him. This is "Becoming the Ocean."
in 2017. One man's vision and passion for all things metal started out as a record store in his house. Years later, the fight against a mainstream empire continues as Shade Beast. An independent metal collective and online store based in Athens, Georgia, is the world's premier heavy metal brand for music heads that value authenticity over the mainstream acceptance. Featuring original t-shirts from some of the best underground artists, as well as stickers, posters from the Shade Beast Presents concert series. Unique, one-of-a-kind collectibles and small curated selection of vinyl and cassettes from the masters old and new. Visit ShadeBeast.com and enter promo code SITHLORD for free domestic shipping on your first order, whether you're a new customer or returning. And be sure to join the Shade Beast social groups on Facebook and the interwebs to keep up with the new release announcements and talk all things metal and Star Wars. You'll never find a more wretched hive of scum and filth. Welcome to the night. You think you know Night Demon? Then the Night Demon Heavy Metal Podcast is for you. Step into the darkness as we peel back the curtain to give you an unprecedented, all-access look into the mind and the heart of the demon. We're talking band history, song analysis, studio anecdotes, stories from the road. It's everything a diehard Night Demon fan could want and more. This is the only place to learn the inside scoop the deep dive trivia, the untold tales from the band members themselves and those closest to the Night Demon story. Need more? The sacred Night Demon crypt will be pried open to reveal demo recordings that have never before seen the light of day. All with in-depth commentary by the band and the people who were there for the writing and recording process. This is a gold mine, a treasure trove of all things Night Demon. Head over to nightdemon.net or wherever you listen to podcasts. Since 2013, there has been a calling from the underground, from the graves of all those unholy, and they decided to make a zine to talk about all of this. Soul Grinder Zine! An independent metal zine to keep you informed on all things metal and horror from the underground. Available in both print and digital formats, they're bringing you the best interviews and reviews out there today. Not only do they do the zine, but they also do compilation CDs. Check them out at facebook.com slash soulgrinder.zine and start your subscription now. Hey everybody, let me tell you about the new sponsor to the Metal Forge, Unchained Tapes. They're an independent Pennsylvania tape label. They focus on extreme metal and punk with a killer approach to the tape scene. Visit their web store at unchainedtapes.bigcartel.com now to get your fill of tapes. And for being a Metal Forge listener, enter the code METALFORGE10 at checkout to get a 10% discount on your total purchase. That's unchainedtapes.com. BigCartel.com What's up, Metal Forge fans? This is Alan Bishop, the alchemist of Indiana's Black Forest and head distiller at Spirits of French Lick. Do you find yourself drawn to the unexplained, fascinated by the Fortean, or enchanted by the paranormal? If the things that go bump in the night resonate in your mind, then tune into my brand new podcast, If You Have Ghosts, You Have Everything. Featuring first-hand accounts, collected stories, interviews, history, and speculation related to all things not of this world. Available now on Anchor, Spotify, Google, Amazon, and more. Set back, relax, and remember, if you have ghosts, you have everything. 
Hey, let me tell you guys about Mercenary Press. They're an independent London label and distributor of all things metal. Mercenary Press delivers the goods from their own independent zine. Trust me, you're going to want to get in on that. To distributing various bands from all over the world, including Cramp from Spain and Sadistic Force from Texas. Visit mercenarypress.bigcartel.com to find out what all they have in stock and what you can order. And for Metal Forge listeners, enter code MetalForge10 to receive a discount on your total purchase at mercenarypress.bigcartel.com. Check it out now. Hey, Metalheads, it's with great pleasure I get to tell you guys about a new sponsor to the Metal Forge, Ageless Art, New Albany. After 20 years of owning and operating Ageless Art in Clarksville, Indiana, Phil Garrett had a vision for a new type of tattoo studio, something that is clean and modern, sleek, refined, inviting. And he's done just that with Ageless Art in New Albany. You can find it at 2736 Charlestown Road, New Albany, Indiana, 47150. Business hours are Monday through Saturday, 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. Sundays are 12 to 6. All sessions are appointment only, so give them a call and go get you some new ink. Or if it's your first time, go get your first one, baby.